Good morning. Let's have some energy. Okay, great. Um, you should all know my name by now. My name is Bilal. Feel free to call me Bilal, not doctor. Um, I will talk to you today about a case study from, from Kenya. Um, and this is sort of the culmination of uh, part a decade's work, worth of work. And I want to talk to you about this very common issue that we've encountered, which is the notion of, of livestock or human beings within protected areas and how to understand that. Okay? Does that sound okay with everyone? Okay. So I'm going to start with some break basic premise. Right? And these are things that I want you to keep in mind throughout the course. Okay? One, we know it's complicated. But we're going to use it's complicated as a starting point and not an ending point. I don't want us to okay. I don't want us to sort of end with it's complicated. I want us to start with it's complicated. Okay? If we end with it's complicated, we're not moving very far ahead. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Complexity can be understood through careful delineation. OK? We have to get out of the habit of saying, oh, but one group says this, and another group says this, and they say this because of this, and I don't know how to proceed. It's probably because we're not thinking hard enough about it. The second main thing that I wanted to, to uh, premise this talk with is that a long-held assumption is that local people are ignorant or uneducated. And that is simply not the case. Okay. We have a habit of victimizing and villainizing local people simply because we don't understand what they're doing. Okay? So we also need to think about that. Thirdly, the things that I'm going to talk to you about, some of you will react quite strongly to. You're like, well, what do you mean by, but that's not what I saw, and how can you say that? If you find yourself reacting strongly to particular themes, Ask yourself why, and that's probably because we have long-held assumptions that are often very difficult to let go, right? The very nature of knowledge is predicated on paradigmatic shifts. Somebody says something about one thing, then somebody else comes along and says, I don't think they had it right here, let me get you to think about it this way. And that goes for a certain period of time, and then we move on from that, right? And so our nature of knowledge is quite evolving. OK, um, because, because it's complicated, I've also put up a series of uh, supplementary papers that talk about these sorts of things, and they'll be part of the handout that you'll receive. OK? And feel free to email me with any questions that you might have as we go along. OK, so I want to start with a little story here. And don't worry about this, this text, but this is a, a news report that came out from the International Fund for Animal Welfare, very prominent. Uh, conservation NGO, right? And it was referencing something that you know we've heard a little bit about in these in this uh, uh, brief uh, course so far, which is the role of livestock inside protected areas. And IFO finds this the International Fund for Animal Welfare finds this to be really bad for conservation, and so they actually have a, this news report titled IFO chasing cattle to conserve the Savo ecosystem. And this was an operation, a military type operation, called Operation Toa Gombe. And if you speak Swahili, that means Operation Remove Cattle. Okay? And here's a little something that, that shows up in the news report, which is 31 suspects were nabbed and 7,500 head of cattle were removed. And how do they justify this? They say, well, the introduction of domestic animals inside protected areas is a crime. It's a crime. And I have to say, what crime have people committed to go back to the areas that they are from? But let me, pro let me provide some greater context for that. Okay? Um, and this is stipulated in the Wildlife Act. Okay? So this is from Kenya. But if you survey the literature on this, you find that it's not specific to Kenya. In fact, livestock have been entered and forcibly apprehended from every, almost every continent except Antarctica. So it's not unique to Ethiopia. Uh, 
It's not unique to Kenya. It's not unique to East Africa. It's not unique to Africa. It's not unique to the whole world. Okay. So that means that we've got to understand it a little bit more. So here we ask the question, why are cattle inside protected areas? And when you read the literature on this, they are what we call dominant narratives, stories that have come to be so dominant that we accept them as truths. And these go along four lines. Right? One argument is a resource scarcity argument, which is actually very, very common. And it goes a little something like this. Human population, increasing human population plus climate change means that there's resource competition and resource scarcity. Okay? Another argument is that pastoralists are poor managers. They don't know how to look after their cattle, which strikes me as somewhat strange given that this is a livelihood system that has evolved over 3,000 years. I think they know a thing or two about raising livestock. The other is a pristine myth argument. Livestock in protected areas are considered unnatural. Oh my god, how can you have cows inside a protected area? Hmm, what came first? Cows or protected areas? The other is an ecological or economic argument, which is that when you have cattle inside a protected area, this is a threat to biodiversity and by extension, tourism, which threatens the ability of the state to gather revenue from tourism. Okay. So these are some common ways of thinking about these problems. I think they're all crap, and I'll tell you why. I want to offer an alternative argument. And this alternative argument is that these notions of cows going into protected areas, what are called incursions, are actually very modern phenomena. They arise out of these changing intersections between where animals are located, and we think that animals simply stay still, and it's the human beings that are moving, which is not the case. But it's also about how we manage resources, the politics of natural resource management, right? Natural resource management is not a static thing. The way in which we manage protected areas has changed, and that will be the lecture this afternoon. Okay. And therefore, by bringing these things together, we provide a more accurate, more nuanced explanation for why we see cows inside protected areas. Is everyone on board with me so far? Okay. How many of you find yourselves reacting strongly at this point? Okay. Two. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are more of you, but, but you're not raising your hands. And that's fine. Okay. So to do all of this, we have to ask ourselves a number of research questions, right? This is the way the academics, the experts, sort of think about problems is through the nature of research questions. And so here's, we, here's one. How are livestock movements inside protected areas socially, politically, and ecologically co-produced? It's not just that one thing happens. One thing happens in relation to something else. It doesn't just magically happen, right? And then we try to think about things from two different perspectives. How do both pastoralists and protected area managers understand this question of cows moving inside and outside protected areas? Okay, both sides of the coin. Why is this important? Well, as, we talked about, as I talked about yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, there are hu still huge gross human rights abuses that are occurring because of how we operate protected areas. And there's the need to remedy these with alternative viewpoints. Okay? When we talk to local people, who exactly are local people? Does one person's interview count as representative of a whole country? And to do this, we have to rely on some theory. And I'll go over these. I'm just going to talk about them here just as, as points, and then we'll go into them in more detail as the course goes along. But we have to think about the way no nature is understood by different groups of people. As I understand it, I think Mona was telling me, there's no word in Amharic for conservation. Fikirte said that, sorry. Is that correct? Okay. So how do we understand what nature is and to whom? There are notions that people will resist certain ideas because they are not consulted. It's an idea we call peasant resistance. There's what we call the materiality of nature, which is that nature is constantly changing. 
it's not static. And then there we have these arguments about non-human agency, which is that animals make decisions based on resource changes. Right? We're just calling it something else. And the way we do this is through political ecology's theoretical and methodological toolkit, which is to look at things that are happening at multiple scales. We have to think about changes that are taking place over the long term. We have to think about them as local places. Many conservationists tend to jump from different places. But if you're not studying one thing for long periods of time, perhaps we miss important environmental events that are taking place, environmental and political events, which shape the outcome of conservation. And as Town mentioned, one of the things that we're relying on more as we move forward into the future, which is the deployment of new technologies like GIS, like GPS, to help us understand both the complexity that exists in the natural side, but also in the social side. And I'll give you a very concrete example of that. Okay? And the way I did this work was through social science as well as ecological methods, key informant interviews, household surveys, aerial systematic reconnaissance flights, geospatial tracking, and uh, participant observation techniques. And please feel free to come and ask me more about these. So I've given you a little bit of an overview. We're now going to talk about these two aspects, the animal geographies of resource use, how animals are using resources, and how politics is affecting how resources are controlled. And we we'll bring those two together. Okay? And then we're going to have, uh, and then I'll bring these all together and, and offer some conclusions. Okay? So, first I have to talk about this idea that we have to challenge existing assumptions about the static nature of the environment. Just because it looks this way today, does it necessarily mean that it looked this way 100 years ago? Right? And so the example is from uh, here, which is an acacia tree in a field of wheat, but it looks like grass, right? which tells us something about the changing nature of the environment. And if you look at the Serengeti Mara ecosystem, there have been four very drastic land cover changes. The Maasai Mara and the Serengeti, as you understand it today, which is this grass, acacia mix with these millions of herds of wildlife never actually looked that way. The first recorded wildebeest migration only occurred in 1961. Very, very recently. And so, so that provides a little bit of context. Now let's look at what we call the political geographies of resource control, how resources have been controlled. And the two things that are simultaneously occurring, and you cannot separate them. One is changes in the security of land tenure. And land tenure means how people own and access land, which is super important for resource conservation. The other has been changes that occur in the creation and modification of protected areas. Right? Let's not assume that protected areas are also static. Right? And so if we look at this case from the Maasai Mara, in the, and I talked about this a little bit, before the 1900s there were these uh, traditional forms of, of, of uh, land tenure where land was shared equally, resources were distributed across wide spaces. Um, in 1904 the British colonial government in Kenya started, started to actually round up local people because they didn't understand them and put them in reserves, like cattle. We rounded up people like cattle and said you cannot move out of these areas. We call them native reserves. We also had them in America with the Native American Indians. In 1968, we start to institute a form of collectivization. And collectivization, you see in very many different f parts of the world. In, in Russia, they were called, and the, the Russian republics, you, they were called Sukhovs. In Mexico, they're called ejidos. In Kenya, we call them group ranches. And that's when we say, OK, now you can have a little bit of a larger piece of land, but don't go out of it. In 2002, we subdivide this, this communal land. So all of this is occurring on one frame. On the second frame, in 1948, we create the Mara Game Reserve, which is a very small, very tiny area, which was used to be where the British colonial governor used to go to hunt elephants and lions. Very, very tiny area. In 1961, we expand. It was about 200 square kilometers. In 1961, we expand this park to make it 1,500 square kilometers. 
In 1984, we excised parts of the park in order to give local people access to rivers and so on. In, in 2005, we start creating these private conservation areas on the edges of large state-managed protected areas. And it's really the confluence of these two things that provide this context as to why livestock are going inside protected areas. Okay? So here is a map of it. And I want you to keep in mind this little notch here. right? And you can see what the old boundaries of the park were. And the, the, the first area that was created in 1961 was between these two rivers, this, uh, 1948. So we go from 1948 to that area, then in 1961 to this large area. In 1984, we excise the boundaries. And this was the communal group ranch, Koyaki group ranch. Okay. So keep in mind this little notch that I'm showing here. So when we subdivide the Koyaki group ranch, this is what it means. Each individual uh, member of the group ranch gets 150 acres. And this is a large protected area. So this is the border of the protected area. And you keep in mind the wildebeest migration is occurring throughout this entire area. 1.3 million wildebeest migrate. Right. So what happens is these private investors come in and they start leasing this land. And when they start leasing this land, they start with a few blocks of land. Then they get more. Then they get more. And essentially, you have this large private protected area on the edge of the state-managed protected area. Now, those who keep livestock in this area have been asked to stay out of the park and out of the private conservancy. So where are the livestock going to go? And here then is the question. Livestock keeping is one of the most compatible forms with wildlife conservation. If you had farms here, people would kill the wildlife because they destroy their livelihoods. Pastoralism, livestock grazing, they eat grass. Grass grows back. They fertilize the ground. Right? And so these private national parks are on these very exclusive lodges, $1,000 a night. It's not Kenyans visiting this. It's overseas visitors. You have these sorts of accommodation. Duck down pillows. Waiters coming to serve you as though you are royalty. Reinforcing a colonial stereotype of what local people are like. But you have to have this private conservancy because it offers a model that is more exclusive for the wildlife viewing experience. People don't want to, tourists don't want to see local people. They don't want to see skinny cows. Right? And to do that, you have to take the people whose land that they have leased to create the private national park and tell them, get out, we don't want to see you, in exactly those words. Okay? And their motivation for doing that is that if you leave the land alone, you get $150 a month. Except people make much more from livestock than the $150 a month. Okay? So here's the take home point so far. There's a long history of economic and ecological marginalization. The spaces available for pastoralism to occur are decreasing. The spaces available for tourism are increasing. And this is resulting in dislocation of people and their livestock from their traditional lands. By removing them from the areas that they, are, that they have come to use over the last 3,000 years, you increase their vulnerability to natural hazards. But this politics alone does not make incursions. Right? Something else has to be happening, which is about where animals are accessing resources. Now, both wildlife and livestock have different space-time geographies, mis meaning that they occupy different spaces at different times. Right? Pastoralism is predicated on mobility, which is that when resources decrease, you shift your assets, you shift your livestock. You can't do that with farming. You can't up and leave and go to another farm. But with livestock, you can move them, which means you can adapt to changing climates. But wildlife are also affected by human practices like burning. In national parks, for example, controlled burning is quite often. Different gills of animals have different forage requirements. For example, zebra are hindgut fermenters, which means that they're able to digest very crude forage quite well. But the relationship between the two 
is looked at as static and as a binary, either humans or wildlife. But we have not enlarged our thinking to think about, well, why if people have been here for 3,000 years and wildlife have been here for a long time, why now are we saying that they are incompatible? Okay. So we have to look at where animals are moving. And here's an aerial shot of the migration. right? And the assumption here is that wildlife movements have, uh, wildlife numbers have remained static. And like I said, wildebeest numbers have changed. See, in 1955, we start them increasing, and, and, and we can talk about why this is the case. If you look at the wet season, um, uh, the, sorry, dry season migration range of the, of the wildebeest, here it is in the dry, here it is in the wet. They're using different spaces at different times. But overall, we see a decrease in the number of wildlife. So why is that? Animals, again, are using different spaces at different times. You can see them that there's that little notch again. Sometimes they're, uh, here they are in the wildebeest in the wet and dry seasons. Now, cattle are moving inside the park because of the creation of these private conservation spaces. But is this a new thing? And if we look at aerial flight records, we can see that this has changed. And there were livestock in the park from as early as 1976. But they were there from even before. I can give you oral accounts of how people were, their homes were burnt down in order to create the park. Think about that. If, what if somebody burnt your house down to create a park? How do you feel? And if we look at where cows are grazing inside the protected areas, you see they're on the fringes. But the more land we dedicate to conservation outside established protected areas means that the the people problem, if you want to call it that, doesn't go away. It simply shifts. And if we look at where cows are located, or where cows are going, we have, this is the role of technology. We put a little GPS on a cow, a $99 GPS, we put it on a cow bell, you put a little bit of duct tape and a canvas collar, and you map the movement of cattle. And you can see this is a real time, not real time, but near uh, 100 times reality of where cattle are going. And you can see that where cattle are going is very purposeful. They have an intended grazing location. Right? They're going to the particular grazing spot here. And then they move back and go home. And you can see that the speed of where the animals are going is changing. So what if then we have this for cattle, but what if we have this for both cattle and wildlife? That would be really cool and interesting. And so when we look at where the distribution of cattle are on the landscape, the dominant assumption is that cattle are overgrazing. They're grazing the same patch of land repeatedly, repeatedly, and they're stupid, and they're ignorant, and they don't know about this. Makes no sense to me. Why would they do that intentionally? And when you map this out, and you look at the densities of where cattle are located in the wet season, you can see that other than when they're released right outside in the morning, they tend to sort of be right outside the Boma around you know, 1.75 kilometers away. If you look at what happens in the dry season, that goes a little bit further. So they're not grazing. The same. And look what happens in the drought. They're, more, they're distributing their livestock a little bit further away. Forage reductions do occur through livestock grazing, but in, in the same spaces, but at different times. But if you start reducing the spaces available for pastoralism to occur, then you start having problems. If we look at where the cows are going, if you look in the dry season, they're going both inside. The, think about this Talek River as the boundary of the park. They're going both inside and outside the park in the dry season, in the wet season, in the dry season. But look what happens in the drought. They're always going inside the park. And this doesn't matter whether you're a rich pastoralist or a poor pastoralist. The frequency of going into the dr park during the drought doesn't matter if you have a lot of little cows, a few cows, or, or a large number of cows. Almost 100% of the time, you're going into the park during the drought. Also keeping in mind that livestock grazing actually helps wildlife. Livestock grazing shortens the grass height. And the shorter the grass height, the more nutritious the grass. You guys know that? Short grass is actually much more nutritious for other species. And so livestock are facilitating wildlife here. The cattle corrals, where, where cattle are put in at night, these become nutrient hotspots for up to 50 to 70 years, and wildlife congregate around them. 
And there's actually insufficient evidence to suggest that competition is occurring between livestock and wildlife, no, despite the vast amount of literature that tells us that there's so much competition. Competition is empirically very, very difficult to prove. Right? Now, keep in mind that the environment is also changing. I'm running long, and I apologize for that. But if you look at the green up curves for grasses at different distances away from households, you can see that no matter how far away you are from a household, whether you're in the park or not, the landscape is desiccating at the same rate. But when the, it rains, you can see areas that are closest to the households tend to green up at the same rate, but don't stay green that long and brown down following rains much faster. But this dry season is also the time that the wildebeest are migrating, and it's also the time that the tourists are coming because it's the North American summer. And so the tourists don't like seeing the cows in the park. And so this idea that livestock are not natural has been represented in the press. This is from the Kenyan newspaper. Tourists miss animals at Maasai Mar. And quotes like this. He said, tourists were asking Kenyan Wildlife Service personnel and tour guides if they visit the country to watch cows and goats grazing. The tourism ministry said that allowing livestock in the park would affect tourism. Right? But you ask yourself, what's more unnatural? This or this? And so when we think about incursions, these incursions are taking place in the park because of this rise of private conservation areas and the promise of more money. But the conservancies have the same tactics of catching and fining and, and uh, all these sorts of other problems for them being inside the park. And this leads to more cattle grazing inside the state managed protected area. It concentrates grazing. And as a result, this question of why are cows grazing into the park is much more complex. So to conclude, well, we can start to think about these livestock movements into protected areas as not incursions, but as reversions to traditional strategies. But the way in which an incursion is coined is in relation to what we consider to be natural. And nature here in this instance is perceived of that without cattle. We have to think about the changing heterogeneity of livestock, wildlife, and landscapes pay attention to the spatial and temporal patterns of resource use and access, and think about the way in which technologies help us understand and contextualize these very complex relationships. It's never as simple as what appears at first sight. Okay? And there is the need to feed these results back to conservation organizations so that they can communicate better with each other about what these consequences are. The Conservancy, for example, doesn't communicate with the National Park authorities. Okay. So is that a failure of local people or is it a failure of communication and the politics of resource management? Okay, thank you. Apologize for going too long. Uh, so that was a really nice example of the importance of understanding the history and local context of protected areas and how management unfolds. Um, and it also the role of scientists, I think, in helping protected area managers understand how uh, protected areas function and um, what roles, especially with local communities, can be. Uh, just two, com two quick comments, one a comment and one a question. Uh, the comment is that uh, in this particular case, I think it's really important also to take the timeline back before 1900, because just before 1900, the rinderpest outbreak happened in Africa. It was extremely important in Ethiopia, very important to the Maasai, uh, resulted in probably 90% death yeah. of, of livestock and huge human life losses as well. And part of the history in this region, although there's a lot of tragedy sort of going on here around pastoralism and uh, open use of, of range resources, uh, but one of the things that certainly happened was as colonialism was unfolding in Africa, uh, following the Rinderpest outbreak, many areas were depopulated and as a result, colonial administrators, you know, whatever their motivations were, were seeing areas that appeared to be empty when in fact they'd had a long history of human use and occupation. And it's difficult sometimes to un 
unpack all of that and make sense of it in the modern context in ways that are equitable, but it's really important to understand all that right. to, to do. So that was just a comment. The question though is, okay, I get that you don't like high-end tourism <laughs> very much and that you don't like the private conservancies, and I have a lot of sympathy on both sides, and I understand that there was a difficult political context that imposed the subdivisions on the Maasai, but ultimately is, is one way to look at this also that there was a question of Maasai self-determination here, and they sold to these private conservancies, and that's the tragedy, I think, is it seems, it, I don't know about the private conservancies, it's been a while since I've been in this area, but it seems like this land tenure change then some way resulted in the Maasai through what would look like self-determination, I guess, giving up some of their grazing grounds and right. having them, right. consequences that they may yeah. not like, or do yeah. they like them? What did the Maasai think of this? Right. Great point. And I agree with the, um, the comment you made about going back even further, but it, it's a really important question for all of us because we often start, our starting point is often the 1980s. And Lee's very valid point here is we need to go back even further, but it begs me to think then, how far back do you have to go? And it depends ultimately on the question that you're asking. Um, the second question about sort of Maasai selling out. Um, one, it's important to not overgeneralize Maasai, right? And so who did the selling out was the elites. And there was a necessary process of co-option about, well, my neighbor signed the lease, and I can see the money being distributed to him. And I feel bad now because my children, my family is going hungry. hungry so maybe I should also do this. Now, the big question here about the selling out point is that the level of education for Maasai pastoralists is actually quite low, formal education, right? And so you are asked to sign a lease for between five and 15 years. How many of us would sign a lease for our property for five to 15 years? How do we understand that process of 15 years? I can't access my land for 15 years, right? And so the leasing process is very, very complicated, and I didn't go into that. Um, but you know, they, sometimes, in some instances, there have been pro places where people necessarily feel the need to sign the lease because of pressure by the conservation organizations, or also from other Maasai local elites, right? And so there's no good and bad here. It's all you know, mixed up together. There's no, these people are right, these people are wrong. It's far more complex than that, as I attempted to show. Okay. We have time for one more. Sure. Okay. Hi, Lu. OK. Thank you very much. I have to come close to you. OK. There we go. <laughs> May I ask a quick question? Yes. And get answered, then I can okay. ask a question later. OK. OK. My first quick question is, uh, this example, which is done in Masamara, can work for every protected area that you imagine? It's an increasing trend, right? The rise of protected, private protected area spaces, I think, is increasing globally. Okay. <coughs> cool. I don't think it's, it's not at all unique to Kenya. And maybe Lee can comment no, about that. True. Yeah. South okay. Yeah. And good. My question here is. You just uh, compare the, especially the cattle grazing in protected area with the tourism industry. So my question here is, uh, imagine the human population uh, 10 years or 15 years ago, how many people are living the earth yeah. and by now. And at the same time, there is technology increment, but our land is just static, mm -hmm. no any change. Mm -hmm. Sometimes maybe it is decreased because of degradation, mm -hmm. less productivity, yep. but the demand of uh, human being is increased through technology right. at the same time, yeah. uh, through number of population yeah. increment. So we need much resources, mm -hmm. but the resource is the same, rather it declined. So we have to sustainably use that for that yep. case i'm just coming to the point for that case we have to conserve that area and produce at the same time a high amount of products like tourism but when we have to uh, cattle grading you say that's natural of course maybe that's natural but some years ago but by now wildlife have their own habitats 
the domestic animal by itself we say a domestic animal have their own habitats i can give you a specific example where i am working nearby it is a mountainous area and have ecological high ecological services not only locally but not only nationally but also the neighboring countries at the base of water source for the nile river mm -hmm. there are a number of cattle there and the area is over degraded mm -hmm. because there is no extra land the people uh, increasingly time to time at the same yeah. time the number of cattle is so that the area is degraded we have a number of domestic uh, i mean endemic animals and endangered even walaibe i mean um, red fox mm -hmm. which is endemic but by now it is going to extinct in the mm -hmm. area because of high human yeah. encroachment especially okay. cattle so how you compromise yeah. this one okay so not all species are alike Carnivore species tend to be much more sensitive to anthropogenic changes than others. Uh, grazing ungulates are much more, uh, they, they, can, they can facilitate each other much more with cattle. Carnivores is a little bit more complex. Um, the question about increasing population growth and sustainability, when you look at pastoralism, I would actually think that pastoralism is actually one of the most sustainable livelihood systems on the planet. And I'll tell you why. Your cows are renewable. Your grass is renewable. Your houses are made out of trees and, and mud. The roofs are made out of grass, all of which are renewable materials. When we think about development and we think about buildings and diesel and all these other things, we're not thinking about where those resources are coming from. Somebody else is being degraded to provide, provide that service, right? So you can think about Addis as being one of the most unsustainable cities. Because where are those resources coming from? Pastoralism derives its resources from in place, right? And the stuff grows back. And we have episodic environmental effects that actually increase certain conditions. So in Kenya right now, we're experiencing El Nino, which has meant that those areas that were highly degraded are starting to recover. Because forage is no longer a limiting factor. I think you missed two points. <laughs> <laughs> the first point in it's <coughs> make it brief so we can get to the rest of the morning. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay. There very are two quickly, points very quickly. for me that is missed. The first one is the carrying capacity of uh, carrying capacity area. has been is a very outdated concept but that scientists have said is no longer of use. And you can talk to me more about it. What's the second point? <laughs> the second point is the, 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 just the development. Because, because of technology, the, human, the, the, the demand of human is increased. Imagine that we have a livestock. The livestock uh, doesn't, need, uh, doesn't fulfill every demand of human being because we need high amount of resources. So if we use a certain area for the just livestock production, maybe it doesn't fulfill the demand of the human being. So, do you like eating steak? Huh? Do you like eating steak? Do you like meat? Of course, yeah. yeah. So, where is that going to come from? Uh, from the meat. But we should have. Uh, yes, of course, you are right. We need different. Um, should we all turn vegetarian? How about you stop eating meat? No, uh, uh, don't, don't misunderstand me. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, I think I kind of get where you're going with some of this. So this is a debate in the U.S., especially in the Midwest, where you know we've fenced off our land. It's not a communal grazing system by any means. And one of the questions out in uh, the tall and mixed grass prairies is, is it better to try to go back to more native herbivores such as bison, which technically they're half cattle these days, um, or is it better to have cattle and introduced livestock? And the question I, th I think that you're trying to get to is the differences in the way that they're behaving in the system. Unless you're in your pastoral system, you yeah. are moving your cattle around and moving them from spot to spot. Cattle tend to find their one spot next to a riparian system that they like. Right. And kind of destroy it basically they right. just stand there and they wallow and they they hang out and roll around and that can cause problems for right. some of your native species so i think right. that's kind of where you're getting right. is that you have this large group of cattle at the at the mouth of a river or on the river banks and they're not really moving anywhere so historically people were moving their cattle around are they still doing that in kenya or is it more right. uh, a contained system right and really really quickly one minute um, 
part of that question comes back to how our resources are distributed. Absolutely. And so in dryland systems, our resources are distributed very heterogeneously, which is why we have movement. If your resources, if it, you know that it is always going to rain between March and May, and it's going to be regular rainfall, which it's not going to be with climate change, how do you manage your resources? So pastoralism is actually quite flexible as a livelihood system, enabled you to move from different points. But we can talk lots later, and thank you for your question. Thank you very much. <laughs>